I used to go to high school crying with a hand on my hand where my mother had slapped me. That, I, that was me, going to school crying. And on Mother's Day, wondering what they're talking about. But I knew in my heart of hearts, and a lot of it was my faith, my congregational church bringing, that something else was waiting for me, that I could, I could do it. Jeanette Paulson Heronico first took comfort in storytelling to escape her abusive mother. She continued to tell stories in different mediums and in her role as founding director of the Hawaii International Film Festival. Jeanette Paulson Heronico, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Jeanette Paulson Heronico has spent her entire life sharing and telling stories. Whether it be through children's storytelling, television, stage plays, or film, Heronico has always known the power of storytelling. Heronico is best known in Hawaii as the founding director of the Hawaii International Film Festival, which has become one of the premier film festivals for showcasing Asian and Pacific films. She's also gone on to be a filmmaker in her own right, producing the award-winning film The Land Has Eyes with her second husband, Vilsoni Heronico. Jeanette says her childhood years were the hardest days of her life, but they also helped her develop her love of storytelling. I consider myself an Oregonian because those first uh, 19 years of my life were very influential. The people there were independent people. They vote a lot. They vote on everything in Oregon. You really have to think, and I like that. I loved politics. My father was a fireman and a labor organizer for public employees. So I was kind of, uh, on his side anyway, kind of political at, the, at an early age and uh, very interested in changing society and making it a better place. My mother, now I know, uh, looking back, was mentally ill, but at the time I didn't know it, and it was a very, very difficult childhood. It was not a happy family. What, how, did, how did you realize later that she was mentally ill? I was emotionally and physically abused. Uh, you know, I was hit around and told I was terrible and an awful person, and I really believed it. <laughs> I escaped a lot, and I escaped in stories, I escaped in um, making up my own fantasies about life, and I, I was determined not to live a life like I was brought up, and I think that gave me enormous uh, drive. And um, like when I was 10, I had my own radio show. 10? <laughs> on what radio channel? On public radio. On public radio. On what, what did you do at 10 as a host? It was called Tots and Teens, and I was a storyteller and I told stories that I wrote, and I had my sister come and imitate animals to the stories. <laughs> I had my girlfriend play the piano. Uh, I'd give little reports on the news. And what, what gave you the confidence to do that? Well, that's kind of what I'm saying, because, I, because my family was so screwy, <laughs> I just kind of thought this other life at a very, very early age. I was giving children's sermons in my church. I found People liked that, and I got a lot of feedback that was positive, which I didn't get in my family. You said your dad gave you inspiration as a, because mm -hmm. of public affairs. Right. What was his role in the household? Uh, gone and apathetic, and leave it to mom to, to do the work, and uh, not terribly supportive. But never mind, he had that fireman outfit and he came to my school on fire prevention week and told mm. us the number to call was our house ever caught on fire and I had a sign when he ran for city council up in my bedroom posted. So uh, he still inspired me in spite of being kind of an absent, apathetic father. Were there other children in the house? There was my sister, and uh, part of my mother's illness really was to pit us against each other, so we never did become close. Um, and my sister died at an early age in her 40s, and that's a huge regret that I never was able to be close to her. But on the saving side of all this family stuff, I had an incredible, strong grandmother on my mother's side. And she was from uh, Russia. She was Volga German. She migrated uh, when the communists came in and took over. They killed all the 
They didn't want any Volga Germans. They didn't want any Jews. They didn't want any Volga Germans. They didn't want any gays. And uh, so those people left if they could. And my grandmother ran away from her family home uh, at 18 and somehow made it to Ellis Island and somehow made it to Seaside, Oregon, and in between fell in love with a, another Volga German, uh, Jacob Bartholoma. And uh, they bought cottages, little cottages to rent. That's where my solace was. That's where I spent my summers. My grandmother was a storyteller. She told me all stories about Russian, German, and. Uh, she cooked and she was, she, I, she loved me. And uh, so it was in Seaside, Oregon that I, that I really felt nurtured. And... While still living in Oregon, Jeanette Paulson Heronico struggled to make ends meet to put herself through college. At age 19, she felt there weren't many career options open to her, so she quickly set her sights on marriage. So I worked two jobs and I went to school and I thought, what I'd really like to be, you know, is, a, is maybe a lawyer, but I can't be a lawyer. There's no women lawyers, and there weren't any women that were going to law school. So I'll marry a lawyer. So I went, I was very self-determined. So I went to Willamette University to the law school and stood down at the bottom of the steps and watched the guys come down the steps. <laughs> and one of them said to me, hi, stranger. And I remembered he had been a guard at a booth that I where I was a hostess during the Oregon Bicentennial. And three months later, we were married. How's that for a story? And, had, and you were conscious. Were you? you were consciously I was consciously looking for a husband, looking for a, a, a husband who was an attorney. Yeah. Wow. That's that I'm is. I'm sorry. That is so <laughs> But but the marriage was not successful. It was not successful because we were so entirely different. He was a conservative Baptist Republican, and I was a liberal Congregationalist Democrat. But but we we had you know there were. Good years. There were good years. We had children we had, together. We had three beautiful, wonderful children, and um, we had we came to Hawaii together. You know, and uh, I learned a lot about business from him. I learned a lot about law from him, and I really was close to his family. It was kind of a substitute family, and they were wonderful. So it's not all black and dark. What was it like breaking into Hawaii when you didn't know anybody and probably didn't have jobs either? So we moved May 20th. So May 23rd was my birthday and I wanted to go to this place called the Sty. I New remember Valley. the Sty. <laughs> remember that. <laughs> right, in New, New Valley. Valley. And we walked into the Sty and I heard the Sons of Hawaii play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started bursting into tears. I cried and cried because the music just, it was Eddie's voice. There was something very deep. Eddie Kamai. There was something in his voice so channeling something so, um, that touched everything inside my soul. It was such storytelling like I'd never heard before. And I just knew this is where I wanted to live forever. Before relocating to Hawaii in 1975, Jeanette Paulson Heronico worked as a professional children's storyteller in Oregon. She even started a storytelling guild and children's festival in Southern Oregon and hoped to continue telling stories when she reached Hawaii. Ray Okamoto was his name and he was in charge of the Artisan Schools program with the Department of Education. And before I came, he said, we'd like you to be a storyteller with the Artisan Schools program in Hawaii. So I did, I came here, and, uh, but it was part time and I needed to work a little more because my husband was having a difficult time getting a job, as a, even though he was an attorney, um, just breaking in. But I, I actually was having a great time. <laughs> I was going around Waimanalo telling stories and everything. Um, but I needed a little more money because uh, we had these three kids and everything. So I went to educational television. And, and that's the DOE television. That's right. Right. That's right. And uh, anyway, they hired me as a production assistant, and I worked my way up as a producer, producer and a writer. But I didn't have a college degree, and but it was that switch from storytelling because when I was going around telling stories, there were all these incredible Hawaiians, Kapuna. They knew this. They knew the story. They knew the stories of the Aina, and they knew the stories of the history. And that's the kind of stories I love to tell. And I thought it's like picking flowers in someone else's garden. These aren't. This isn't right for me to be doing this. But film. That's another way. That's another way to tell stories. And so I quit being the storyteller in the schools and devoted my time 
to educational television, but still as an independent contractor because I didn't have a degree. Jeanette Paulson Heronico would go on to earn a college degree from Chaminade University in Honolulu. In 1980, she started a new job in public relations at the East West Center, an educational and research institution on the campus of the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Her new job would soon lead her to the creation of Hawaii's premier cinematic event, the Hawaii International Film Festival. Where I really wanted to work was the East West Center. Uh, and, the, and people say, well, why? And I said, because I'm really interested in uh, cross-cultural relations. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested in bringing people together from Asia and the Pacific and the United States. Where do we meet and where do we differ? And how do we negotiate those different? Um, that's always been a real strong interest in those questions. So when they had an opening in their public relations department for a community relations director, I applied and I was hired um, by Everett Kleinitz, was the president at the time. And he directed me to think of three ideas that would bring the, the community closer together to the East West Center. And one of the ideas why don't we create a film festival? And why don't we put the emphasis on Asia and Pacific films made by Asians and Pacific Islanders and have some from America? And why don't we have an academic symposium where we talk about the differences and the similarities? And why don't we have it free? And why don't we take it to the neighbor islands? And why don't we take tours all around and show these films with, with, with scholars, you know, and talk about these issues? He said, oh, I just love that idea. You go for it. Of course, I'm not giving you any money. You have no budget, so you go raise the money. And I said, fine, I like to raise money. I you thought, like to raise money. I do like to You like to ask people for money. I, because here's what I believe, and you, you know this. You bring people who, who have money and a, and a cause that they want, and they want to do, mm. they're waiting for you because they want to meet the artists, they want to, they want to be part of a bigger vision. Mm. I really believe that. And, so I like to put people together. I like to do that. So I thought, um, I've got to have Jack Lord be for this, because he's got money and he's got a name, but I didn't know him. So I talked to Kobe Black, and she introduced me to him, and we just hit it off famously. And he wrote a check, 5000, you know, first check we got. And then we got to have theaters. So who owns the theaters? The person in town was Art Gordon. You know, Art, Remember him? one of the most wonderful men I've ever met in my life. And I went to him and I explained this idea that we'd have this theme of when strangers meet and we want to have Asian films. And he said, you know what, that it's free. And they're going to have Asian films. And he loved Asian films, particularly Japanese films, which he'd shown a lot. Uh, he says, I'm giving you the varsity theater. So that's how we got it started until six months in, a new president came to the center. He didn't like the idea of a film festival at all and asked me to stop. But this, this is, must be Victor Lee. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was Victor Lee, Victor Howley. But he really did not believe that the East-West Center with the mission as he saw it included anything to do with film. He thought it should be very, and he didn't think anybody in public relations should be creating program, that that should be left to the scholars. So it was legitimate um, policy differences, but you know, affected my life because he told me to stop. And I said, you know what, it's too late because the tickets have been given out. So he says, well, just the first one then. And, um, but the first one, the papers called, maybe you called, I don't know, <laughs> where were you? <laughs> <laughs> and there were lines around the block, and people were loving the festival. And he called me in the office and presented me with flowers. He says, you did it. This is great. But it's got to be small. It's got to be academic. And um, yeah, j just keep it controlled, and you got to raise all your money outside. You didn't keep it small and controlled, Jeanette. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> Maybe that was my fault, you know, I mean, it was, and maybe because of my background, I was used to people kind of on my back and telling me, no, 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 you can't do it. Maybe that's why I did it. 
Under the leadership of Jeanette Paulson Heronico and with an army of volunteers, the Hawaii International Film Festival grew and eventually became an independent, non-profit organization splitting off from the East-West Center. Jeanette went through a divorce from her first husband and tried to find balance in her new role as the festival director, single woman, and mother raising three children. When one has an abusive uh, parent, um, unfortunately that also, that sometimes shows up in their own parenting. Mm -hmm. how, how was parenting for you? Mm, great question. Uh, I, you know, again, you have to ask my children and I still ask them mm -hmm. <laughs> and it drives them crazy. They say, oh, mom, stop asking that. Uh, I had three and um, one of them was extremely difficult uh, and and she is no longer with us and um, you know maybe maybe there was a gene there I don't know it was kind of almost like reliving my mother's story through mm -hmm. my daughter uh, except my daughter was m much more bright and uh, loving and a, a wonderful parent herself but the other two say that I was okay but I know in reality that I, I was gone too much with throwing myself into the film festival. Uh, it's almost sort of an escape thing and I, I, I regret that, that I wish I'd spent more time with them, but they keep assuring me that I was a good mom, so I hope they're right. And, that's and they turned out pretty, they turned out great. Jeanette Paulson Heronico poured her passion into growing the Hawaii International Film Festival. After living as a single independent woman for over a decade, Jeanette says she has the film festival to thank for introducing her to the man who would become her second husband and soulmate. We wanted scholars on our jury and we wanted people from different Asia and Pacific places. And I, I didn't have a lot of Pacific Islanders that knew a lot about film. So I asked my friend Jean Charlot, who was on the film selection committee with us, where can I find a Pacific Islander that, and he says, well, you know, there's this uh, uh, student that's getting his PhD uh, from Fiji, and he's at the East-West Center, and I, he's smart, he's written books, he's written all kinds of plays, I, he, he'd be great on your jury. He didn't actually say student, he just said this person. So I, I thought that he was gonna be an old man after I read his resume, and so we had the jury, and he walked in and I thought, oh my, I mean, that's not an old man. It's he, was, he was younger <laughs> than you were, right? Yeah, he was pretty cute, too. But he was married, so I left my hands off of him, but I made him my friend and put him on my film selection committee, okay? So when he got divorced, I decided I would fix him up with some of my young girlfriends. Then he finally said to me, I'd like to take you to dinner. And I thought, this is really strange. I mean, we've had lunch, we've gone to meetings, but why would he want to take me to dinner? Oh, he wants to announce that he's gonna marry this woman I'd fixed up. So he went up to dinner and he says, before I open this bottle of wine, I want to tell you that I've been in love with you for two years, but you've been so busy with the film festival, I'm imitating it, sorry, <laughs> that you haven't even noticed. And I thought, oh my gosh. So I said to him, well, he, he's a Pacific Islander and I'm Caucasian, okay, I can get over that, but I'm much older than you are. And he said to me, I have been in love with women younger than me. Where does it say I can't be in love with someone older than me? I have learned in love, age and race make no difference. Do you think you can do the same? And I thought, here I'm running this film festival when strangers meet and haven't dared to think like that. So I said, let's give it a try. And that man's name is Vilsoni Heronico. And a year and a half after that dinner, we were married and we've been married 19 years. And you have very similar interests. Oh yeah, we're both storytellers. My, my, my kids say, you finally found someone as crazy as you, Mom. <laughs> you know, he, he, we're storytellers, we're filmmakers. He's written plays, I'm starting to write plays now. In 1996, Jeanette Paulson Heronico decided to walk away from the Hawaii International Film Festival, the organization that she created and to which she gave so much of her personal life. And why did you just 
choose to quit the film festival? That's the object of my first show called <laughs> Wild Wisdom. And it was about because my mother, who I've talked about quite a bit in this show, um, got early Alzheimer's because it ended that there was a gene from the Volga Germans that my family had. Uh, and 50% of those people, meaning me, Volga Germans, get early Alzheimer's. I saw it on CNN News one night, and I realized my mother, my, my grandfather, my sister, and three of my cousins had all died of early Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what if I have that gene? So I called the Alzheimer's Association. They didn't know. There was no way to test. And I thought, man, I've just been given my whole life the film festival. A single woman, I, I don't even know if I like apples and oranges. I'm quitting, and I'm going to go around the world, and I'm just going to enjoy my life because I might lose my mind. <laughs> Who knows? Mm -hmm. And that's why I quit the film festival. But people didn't know that at the time. But, th but also I'd been doing that for, well, it was uh, 1981 to 96. So that was long enough. 15 years. <laughs> so um, I did, they did find out about the, a test. And I did take the test. And I don't have that gene. I wouldn't marry Vili until I knew that. So, and he told me, he said to me when we went in to get the results of that test, he said, I don't care if you have it or not. I still want to marry you. In the year 2000, Jeanette Paulson Heronico stepped out of her comfort zone as someone who shares and promotes films to someone who creates films. She and her new husband, Vilsoni Heronico, set out to make their first feature film, The Land Has Eyes, filmed on her spouse's tiny home island of Rotuma, Fiji. Yeah, we decided to make a, f a feature film together, and he had a he had a film, and we that in mind, a script in mind, and we took it to Buddhadev Dasgupta from Calcutta, who was on the jury the same year. Vili was on it, a very very dear friend, uh, and he said, "You can't make that film. Your first feature film must be your own life. You mm. have to go fishing deep inside, and write your own life story. That's your first feature film." And Billy took that advice literally, and he, start, he threw that away, and he started writing his own life, and then he got writer's block, because it was getting very personal. And um, I said, change it to a girl. So Billy became Vicky, mm -hmm. and uh, we made The Land Has Eyes. We were on the island of Rotuma for three months to make it. And you didn't have a big budget, and you had the villagers no. playing roles. Yeah, it was wonderful. And it was just a very courageous <laughs> and <laughs> um, it was a gamble, right? And it's, yeah. a, it's a beautiful movie. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, it, it was probably the uh, deepest experience of, and talk about shattering the illusions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that takes the cake, that, that did it. Because being married to him and seeing him in Honolulu uh, and uh, then to go back to his island, which I had not been to, where he's the director and I'm the producer, and living in his family's home. Uh, yeah, it was the most challenging and the most rewarding experience of my life. <laughs> You know, I look at my life from where I am now, and I am so satisfied. I'm so happy with my life. I don't think I've ever been happier. And one reason uh, is a lot of my dreams have been realized. And I'm still dreaming, and I'm still realizing more dreams. You're still working, right? I'm still working. But I'm, I'm just wanted to say that the, the, the secret has been to what Joseph Campbell said, and that's, Follow your bliss, follow your passion. I really honestly believe that each one of us has been born with a very special, unique gift. And it's our job in our lifetime to find out what that gift is and to shine it as bright as we can, to treat it like a precious diamond. And you don't have to do everything. Like, you know, I, I, I can't sew. I can't can fruits like so many <laughs> of my Oregon friends can. But I can tell stories. And I can, uh, I can, I know how to make a movie, and I know how to get things done. And I really love involving 
other people and projects. That's my little diamond. We each have that diamond, and you've got to find it and shine it and give it away. The film The Land Has Eyes, produced by Jeanette Paulson Heronico and directed by her husband Vilsoni Heronico, debuted at Robert Redford's prestigious Sundance Film Festival in 2004 and went on to win Best Film at the Waiora Maori Film Festival. At the time of this conversation in 2016, Jeanette had been out of the film festival spotlight for some years, but she continues to curate and distribute Asian and Pacific films to universities and libraries through a film distribution company called Alexander Street Press. And Jeanette and husband Vilsoni were setting out to make a new short film atop Mauna Kea on Hawaii Island. Mahalo to Jeanette Paulson Heronico of Honolulu for sharing your story with us. And thank you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha Awiho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. I'm not afraid. When I, when I stand before a crowd, I'm not afraid. Again, maybe it goes back to that childhood. That's, that's my home. I'm 10 years old. You know, I was, I was performing at 10, as live audiences as well as... Uh, and, I, and I've just never been afraid in front of, I'm sometimes it's harder one-to-one. -one.